have been in a sermon series for probably four months, but we've only had three months worth of messages. And the series is called A Light in the Darkness, and it's based on the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. We've already had seven messages. This is number eight. The first chapter of the book of Revelation is where Jesus reveals himself to John in a vision, a vision that brings him to his knees. Jesus then tells John, I want to give you these messages for the seven churches in these seven prominent cities. I want you to deliver it to the pastor, the angel. We believe the angel meaning the pastor of those churches. He had a pastoral relationship with the pastors of those churches. And so Jesus gives him a message and then John is, or, or those messages for those churches are actually shared throughout Revelation 2 and 3. We've already looked at the message to the church in the city of Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Sardis. And today we're going to study the message of Jesus to the church in Philadelphia. My message is entitled, His Power in Our Weakness. His Power in Our Weakness. I'm going to read to you verse 7 through 13. Here's what the Bible says. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have a little power and you have kept my word and you have not denied my name, behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and they are not but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet And make them know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my name. My new name, Jesus says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we want to have an ear to what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, even now through these words. Amen? This is the word of the Lord that we have read As always, I want to give you just a little context for the city of Philadelphia to better understand the the church's context. We know, according to this map and history, that Philadelphia was the sixth city on the Asia Minor postal route, which is about 30 minutes southeast from Sardis, as you can see. Philadelphia was actually the last city of Asia before you enter the roads that head off to Syria. You can actually see this on the map. It was essentially sort of the last Greek city um, and civilization, and so it was considered sort of a missionary town in a sense. It was a door to the east, and so those that ran the city over periods of time, there were different hands of power that were exchanged. They considered that their sort of part of what they were to do was to be an outpost, a missionary outpost that could continue to bring the Greek civilization to the rest of uh, the unconquered world and that Roman would, Rome would eventually dominate. The city was founded by Eumenes II in honor of his brother who he loved, so the city Actually, the name means the city of brotherly love. We have a Philadelphia in the USA, and so we probably all know that. But he loved his brother so much that he named it Philadelphia. The agriculture of Philadelphia was, this, was second to none. They had vineyards all around the city, and so because of that, they had a lot of wine. And you know what happens when they got a lot of wine. They had a lot of money. You didn't know what I was going to say. It was a rich city. It was a strategic city. It was an important city, lots of trade, lots of commerce, lots of coming and going. We had, they had surrounding volcanoes, lots of earthquakes. I've already talked to you about the great earthquake of 17 AD, rocked this city, brought it to its foundations, and they sought to be recovered ever since. In fact, the emperor Tiberius at the time in 17 AD to like 20 AD to restore the city, he heavily taxed the people of the city. And uh, as a result of that, was able to rebuild it. Made a lot of promises 
So historians tell us that the people of the city, the residents, were very bitter because of the tax. And so there was a tax levy that was lifted over a long period of time. In other words, they didn't have to pay tax because of their past and their history. But I'm going to talk to you more a little bit about that uh, in just a little bit. Philadelphia is one of the two churches. The church in Philadelphia is one of the two that Jesus had no correction for. And so as a result of that, we want to pay attention to the good things that Jesus had to say because we want to be the type of church, Northwest Church, where Jesus has no correction for us because we are walking in his ways, we are obeying his word. And so I want to talk to you about a couple things today that we find in the text. And the first is I want to talk to you about the revelation of Jesus that we find right here. And I've shared, with you, shared this with you before, that in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus says all of these things about himself, or Jesus reveals himself, sorry, and he reveals himself to John in a certain way, many different aspects that John observes or Jesus says, but one of those aspects is talked about to each church in each city, only one of those, but they're all mentioned in chapter one. And so there's a revelation of Jesus to each city. But here's what it says in verse seven and what he chooses to say to the church in Philadelphia. It says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy and who is true and who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut and shuts and no one will open. Well, we know there's two things that he's saying here. First of all, Jesus is saying, He who is holy, he's saying, I am holy. Holy means to be set apart. It means to be separate. It means to be not ordinary. Or another way of saying it is to be special. However, that's not necessarily what Jesus means by this. The Hebrew equivalent for this word in the Old Testament for Yahweh is essentially ascribing Jesus to being the Messiah and to God. You see in the Old Testament, he is the Holy One. He is the Holy One of Israel. And John 6, 69 and 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus is also called the Holy One of Israel. And so let's be very clear about this. What is being said here is a claim to deity. Jesus is the Son of God. You cannot mistake this. You cannot misunderstand this. Jesus is clearly saying, I am holy. I am the Son of God. The Father and the Son are one. We cannot misunderstand this. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is holy. There is none like them, like him. Jesus is divine. It is very clear what is being said here. He also says right after this, I am true. This word means real, it means actual, it means not fake, it means authentic. We live in a culture, we live in a time where everybody's looking for what is real, everybody is looking for what is true and authentic. We live in an age of misinformation. We don't know who to trust. We don't know if our leaders at the top are trustworthy. Can we trust them? Are they lying to us? Come on, you're in the same world I'm living in. Can we trust anybody? Can we trust any party? Can we trust any politician? Can we trust any pastor? Can we trust any local leader? Can we trust any manager, any doctor? Come on, there's a skepticism uh, nationwide in every field that we transact in. And so we live in a time where there's been so much misinformation, I think it's led us to wonder what is true, what is real, what is authentic. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is true, Jesus is real, Jesus is authentic. Look no further than Jesus. He will not let you down. So he says about himself, and we certainly believe that he is true and that he is holy. And he's saying that in contrast to the emperor Domitian at the time, because something happened contextually, historically, that that I think is interesting, and I think sort of puts Jesus in this place where he's giving a contrast. The emperor Domitian made this edict in 92 AD where he had the people of the city or the military came in and they took out half of the vineyards. Now the vineyards was the reason that they had such a great economy. It was the reason that they were wealthy. And they took out half of the vineyards so that they could plant grain. Well, there's all these volcanoes around the city and so volcanic ash is is not good for soil and so the grain didn't grow. The grain was supposed to be for those that were in the military. And so as a result of this, it shipwrecked the economy. 
And so the people of the city were bitter against Domitian. Their leader, the one that's ruling them, actually did not have their best interest in mind. Shipwrecked their economy. They saw that. They were angry. They were bitter. Jesus steps up and he says, I am true. I am real. I am authentic. I have your best interest in mind. And we can be sure of that today. Friend, people are going to let us down Everyone at some point is going to let us down because there's only one who is perfect, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus also says about himself, and I'm summarizing it by saying Jesus has all power and authority. Look what he says here in verse 7. He says, I have the key of David. And this is a reference to Isaiah 22, 22, which I'm sure you haven't read for a while. But in Isaiah 22, 22, it's prophesied that Eliakim who is the prime minister to Israel's king, would bear the king of David. In his role, he controlled access to the king. Eliakim is a type of Jesus who decided who would be allowed access to the king. He had the key of David. I don't know if you've ever read this or thought about what the key of David is, but it's funny when you read Isaiah 22, 22, it says the key of David will be on his shoulder. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, our keys, I have a lot of digital locks, but our keys are like this big. You just put a key on your shoulder. It doesn't seem to make much sense. But in those days, keys were large. Keys went into a door, and they were meant to open bars. And so, yes, a key could actually fit on your shoulder if you ever thought about that. That's why history is real important. Wouldn't you agree with that? The key of David is on your shoulder. <laughs> sort of a funny thing, but no, he had the key of David on his shoulder, He's talking about doors, keys, giving access. Eliakim was a type of Christ in a sense that he had, he had the ability to bring access into the treasuries of the king, into the presence of the king. He has, Jesus has the key of David. What is it? It's a messianic picture, number one. But number two, it is saying that Jesus alone is the one that gives entrance into the presence of God. Jesus alone is the one who gives entrance into the presence of God. In other words, he has all power. He has ultimate power. No one can compare to King Jesus. He says in verse 8, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. This is a powerful concept when you think about what is being said here in terms of power and authority. Jesus opens doors for us. No one can shut. I mean, in the world, it's almost like we, we have a bad mood because we feel like when certain people come to power, certain people are taken out of power. I, I don't know if you've had any of these feelings. I know that we probably have a diverse opinion and, and uh, view in the room. But either way, you can relate to the fact that we tend to put a lot of our hope in who's in power, and then they disappoint us inevitably is what happens But here's what we know is true, is that no matter who's in power, Jesus has all power. And this is an important concept. It doesn't mean that politics and policies and these things don't matter. But listen, friends, this is one of the reasons as we gather together, we need to be encouraged as the church of Jesus because we're reminded that Jesus actually does really have all authority and all power. Will you be reminded of that today? He says to his church, who is weak and seemingly insignificant and small in number and doesn't have any political clout, he says to them, I have placed an open door in front of you and no one can shut it. In other words, I have all power. You may not have a voice to anyone. You may not have a vote. You may not matter. You may be insignificant. You may be weak in the scheme of all of this. But Jesus is like, I am not. I have all power. And if I put an open door in front of you, that means you have access. That means you can do what I tell you you can do. And this concept is throughout the scriptures. We see in Acts 14, 27, the believers rejoice that God opened a door for the Gentiles to be saved. In 1 Corinthians 2.12, Paul shares that God opened a door for him. Not a man. God opened a door for him to preach in that city. In 1 Corinthians 16.8, Paul says God opened a wide door. Everybody say wide door. I like wide doors. You know, it makes me feel like I'm smaller than I am. You know, God opened a wide door so that I could preach to the Gentiles. I could preach the gospel in Ephesus, a place where the gospel was not being preached. God opened a door where no man could open a door. God opened the, gave Paul the access, the ability to do what he needed to do. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul says that the church is praying that God would open a door to preach Christ. Here's what we know. God has all power. 
God opens doors, God shuts doors, God can raise up leaders, God can take down leaders. His church must be praying, must be praying that he would open up doors. And when he does, we must walk through the doors that he opens for his glory. Amen. He has all power, and we know this to be true. The next thing we can read from this passage is found in verse 8 when we look at the commendation of Jesus. What does Jesus say about this church that is good, that we can glean from? In verse 8 it says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Because you have little power and you have kept my word and have not denied my name, behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. Four things that are said here. We'll break them down. The first one is, he says, you have little power. This term, most people believe, means that they were a small church. They were a weak church. They had few workers. Pastor Steve gave us a a prophecy today that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. They had few workers. They had few resources. They did not have any voice. They had no uh, political voice or political clout in their time and in their generation. The language here could otherwise be worded, because you have little power, I have set before you an open door. Because you are weak, I will show myself to be strong. Because this is what you seemingly look like, I want to show my power in you. And this language fits the concept that the Bible preaches from Genesis to Revelation on behalf of man. That though we are weak, yet he will be strong. Amen? His power is made perfect in our weakness. The Apostle Paul knew this. Many men and women throughout history, throughout the Bible, have known this. You and I must know this. Though we are weak, yet we will be strong through Christ if we are doing the will and the work of God. Let the weak say, I am strong. Amen. The Bible shows us this concept. He doesn't need a lot. He just needs all you. Come on, you're working with me today. Where are you at? Show up and show off. The Bible shows us this concept of strength, his strength, his power in our weakness, that it's not about our numbers and our money and our might and our skills and our gifts. It's about the power of God. It's about God's power over all things. It's about God's authority over all things. It's about how God can open a door when there is no door there seemingly in front of us. We always say this. I don't know if you've been around long enough to know this, but I'm, I've been around just long enough to remember God will make a way where there is no way. You should say that once in a while because we get discouraged in the world that we live in because we give too much credence to the ways and to the things of man. But God will make a way where there is no way. He can do that in your life. He can do that in my life. He can do that in our city. He can do that in our country and in our world. And every issue that we put on the table, God can make a way where there seemingly is no way. Men make their plans, but God ultimately has power over the future. This is God we're talking about today, and I know that's what you came to listen to to and listen about. God took a small and seemingly insignificant nation, and he used them mightily. We're talking about the nation of Israel. How does a nation as small and seemingly insignificant as the nation of Israel make it as long as they've made it? And there was a time where six million Jews were murdered, and yet the nation still, still today, significantly, even though they seem weak, God has protected this nation, and God can protect his church, and God can reach all the nations of the world, but we see in the Bible how God has done what man cannot do. God takes our lack, and he makes it abundance. We see him take five loaves and two fish, and he feeds thousands. We know that from these stories and from reading the Bible that there are no extraordinary people There are only ordinary people that believe the word of an extraordinary God. That is what we believe. That is what scripture teaches. And that is what we know to be true. So when Jesus tells this church, you have little power, when he tells them you are weak, and it looks like everybody else would think that you don't have much going for you or you're not able to get things done, that is a lie. All you have to do is obey me. The question is, are we obeying Jesus? 
The second thing here he says is, you have kept my word. The church not only knew what God's word said, but they clearly believed it and obeyed its teachings. They did not deviate from the truth of God's word, from the promises of God's word. And we can certainly glean this today in our time as well. And I would tell you that when you and I stay true to the word of God, it reveals the authenticity of our faith. When we stay true to the word of God, that which we believe, it reveals the authenticity of our faith. I was watching a skeptic, which I I do just to kind of brush up on what everybody believes. I read books on other sides, and I I do that because I like to know how I'm going to talk to people uh, in the world that I live in. And I used to be a non-believer, and now I'm a believer, and so sometimes it's about you know, rational discussions and what are people saying today and thinking today. So I was watching this guy talk and one of the ways that he was breeding skepticism and all these people that were listening to him is he was talking about how he was a professor in this certain college and it was in the Bible Belt and he was saying to them that how many of you believe that the Bible is God's word? And he said, in the Bible Belt, all of these young people in this college class just shot their hand up. Everybody believed in the class. There were some that didn't, but most people believed that God's word was was from God. How many of you believe the Bible is God's word? It's from God. All the hands shoot up in the room. And he goes, okay. And he goes, how many of you have read the Da Vinci Code? And everybody's hand went up, you know. I never did. But anyways, he, for some reason, people have read that. Have you read, how many have have read the Da Vinci Code? You don't even want to raise your hand, do you? All right. (laughs) You just embarrassed me before you even said anything. All right, so he said, how many of you have read the Da Vinci Code? Obviously, this was several years ago. And like everybody during that time had read the Da Vinci Code. Oh, you've read all of the Da Vinci Code? Everybody said, yeah, I've read all the Da Vinci Code. And he said, how many of you have read the whole Bible? And he said there were just very few hands. And so here's what he did. And he's a skeptic, not a Christian. And he said, so you're telling me that God wrote a book and you didn't read it. I'm just going to go home. I'm just going to go home now. (laughs) That's convicting, isn't it? I'm telling you, a non-Christian skeptic was trying to prove to Christians that they don't believe what they say they believe. Yeah. Yeah. So at Northwest Church, we have a Bible all the way through the the Bible in a year plan. (laughs) Pastor Ben, Pastor Ben, thank you so much for getting us to read the Bible all the way through because it puts our money where our mouth is, Pastor Ben. You just want us to read God's book. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes, that's right. And so, uh, you know, and he was able to prove his case. He was knocking on their door, you know, and so here's the deal. You're not going to keep God's word if you don't read God's word. You're not going to know what to do and you're not going to know what to keep. And if, the, if you have conviction right now, friend, you just let that conviction lead you all the way to a daily Bible study with the Lord. There's no guilt. There's no shame. But listen, if the skeptic is going to say that to us, we've got to own it. So it's very important if we believe God's word is from God, let's not only read it, But let's keep it. Let's follow it faithfully because it proves the authenticity of our faith. One of the reasons why people fall into error and false doctrine and false teaching is because they don't know the word of God. You know, and I'm just not going to be able to give you enough of the word, obviously, so that it makes you and keeps you strong. Keeping God's word has everything to do with us knowing God's word ourselves. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were the opposite of this. They were hypocrites. And we see this today. Every one of us disdains hypocrisy. And so we can't allow ourselves to live in hypocrisy. We want to keep God's word as they did. So we're committed to knowing and obeying God's word in our lives. The third thing Jesus says is, you have not denied my name. So in connection with that, he references a synagogue of Satan. He says, there's those who are part of the synagogue of Satan, and they are not Jews at all. And so there were Jews in the city that were persecuting the church because the church had received Jesus as the Messiah. And obviously, the Jews that were a part of this synagogue were saying Jesus is not the Messiah, so they brought persecution to the church. And in spite of the pressures that the church faced in the city, the church remained loyal to Jesus. They did not deny his name, although they were tempted to. They were tempted to be afraid. Do you remember what Paul said to Timothy? He said, you have not received a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Why would Paul say that to Timothy? Because Timothy was tempted to be afraid. 
Paul would not waste his words. He's telling a young pastor, you have not received a spirit of fear. You have received a spirit of power, love, and sound mind, but you will be tempted. And we know that because the very reason he would say how he needs to posture himself shows that Timothy would be tempted otherwise. But Jesus tells the church, you have not denied my name. Now, it does not happen overnight for people to deny the name of Jesus. It starts small. It starts small, and then it leads. The conveyor belt leads all the way to a place where ultimately we do what Peter did when he betrayed Jesus. I don't even know the man. Peter could not even conceive of himself doing something like that, and yet he did, and yet he did. And so Jesus says to this church, you have not denied my name. And the fourth and final thing he says as a commendation, he says, you have kept the word of my perseverance. Uh, this doesn't really make any sense, so we're thankful that there are other translations that are, say this a little bit better. The NIV clarifies, Jesus would say, you have kept my command to endure patiently. You have kept my command to endure patiently. What does that mean? Jesus has told the church that they need to endure patiently with all they're about to go through. There's a previous command that he had given them, and now he's saying, I'm acknowledging that you have obeyed me. You did what I told you to do. And this is really important because the opposite of doing what Jesus was commending them for is giving up. The opposite is giving up. In other words, Jesus could say it in modern terms, you did not give up, you did not give in. And friends, you know this, I know this, When we give up, it will always cost us something. When we give up, it will always cost us something. There is an exchange. When we give up our time with God, Pastor Darby last week talked about our life in the secret place. If we do not have a time with God, what we're exchanging for that, listen, when we give up our time with God, I believe that our discernment will be dull. I believe that our sensitivity with the Holy Spirit will be dull. We cannot live off the spirituality of others. See, when you live your life in the secret place before God and you have something with him in the secret place, it says in Matthew chapter 6, he will reward you openly. So what I believe is when we have this prayer life in the secret place, when we come to the gathering place, we've got something to give away. And when we live our life in the marketplace, we've got something to share with others and we won't deny the name of Jesus. So you have secret place, gathering place, and marketplace, but there is something powerful that happens for you and for me in the secret place that causes us to be a carrier. It causes us to be a carrier, life-giving advocates of Jesus to people in the gathering place and also in the marketplace. When we give up our time with God, it's an exchange. When we get consumed more with other things than with the Lord, we become advocates of those things. It does not mean that we shouldn't have other focuses in life. I'm reading a lot of books right now on a lot of other things, and I I think that's a good thing for us to learn and for us to grow. But those things can consume the main thing, where we get to the point where skeptics can look us in the face and say, you guys don't even live the way that you ought to if what you believe is true. And let that not happen to us. He's saying, you have endured patiently, but endurance looks like something. It looks like being with the Lord personally. It also looks like being part of God's church. Now, we live in a weird world where that's online, that's on site, and there's no guilt in whichever way that we do that. But let me just tell you as a pastor, and whether it's our church or any church, I've been a pastor far longer than I should be at the age that I'm at at this point. You know, it's like almost all of my Christian life I've been a pastor, which probably is not healthy and I do not recommend. But I have watched people walk away from the family of God. I have heard it all. Even in this season, I've heard it. You know, we can just, uh, we don't need the church of God. We are Christians. We are the church. The people are the church. In four weeks from now, I'm gonna give you a message about the church. And we're gonna go through the Bible on what, biblically the church is because I think that we need to restore and recapture the purpose of the church, the biblical purpose of the church, not our definition of the church, but usually we come up with new definitions when we want to make an escape of some kind. 
And the flesh will begin to rule in, those, in the vacuum of time where that takes place. And I've been watching it for years. I've watched people walk away, and I have seen even some of my own close friends who have debated me and challenged me and all of that, and they've said, well, I just, you know, I love God, but his people not so much, and, you know, we're doing church at home. We're doing bedside fellowship. I'm not talking about online, guys. Amen, if you're tuning in and you are consi- love that. Amen, we gotta do that. I'm talking about when we just move away from the family of God. I'm talking about when we move away from the connective tissue that God has put us into, whether it's Northwest Church or it's whatever church out here, regardless of what local church it is, I have watched people not become more evangelical, not become more generous, not become more gracious, not become more kind, not become more giving to the world that they live in. It is a, de- it is a deception. It is a delusion. It wouldn't be so serious in the word of God if we did not need one another. And so I've got no agenda. I'm not asking for your money right now. I'm not asking for it. I don't just want people to sit in the seats. I'm not, it's not what I'm asking. I'm not saying, come sit and watch me talk and light my hair on fire. That would be great. That would really fulfill my destiny in life. And I would just love that. It's a wonderful gift to me if you would just watch me and make me feel better and blow up my social media accounts. I mean, that's sickening. You know, that's sickening. No, what we want in the church is we want the gifts of God that are resident in the people of God to flourish and to grow. And we want him to fill this house with his spirit and we want him to bring revival through men and women and young and old and the people of God. And we need to be a house of prayer for all the nations. We need to be a beacon of truth. We need to be a lighthouse. We need to come together, whether we do that online or on site, because if we give up what we are doing here, listen, the word will not cut the way that the word is supposed to. We will not be as sharp and sensitive as we need to be. I have watched it for years, and I am not wrong, and we are not an exemption from the truth. It's the truth. People drift, we can drift. And so if we don't endure patiently, especially in difficult times, I have called people to be patient in this season. I truly have. I truly have. I believe this season has proved what's really in us. Because when you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. If you squeeze a Christian and Christ doesn't come out, that is an opportunity for us to radically repent and change our lives. But for some reason, it has been a season to justify our anger and, uh, and some of the issues that we have. That is sin, and it is wrong. You and I live before the Lord as people who are repentant every day of our life. It isn't about me or who's more spiritual in the room. It is that we live before God Almighty, and we want to ensure that we are doing what He desires. Or what else are we doing? What else are we giving ourselves to? Jesus says, you've endured patiently. You have not given up. Giving up is a cop-out. Giving up is a way out, but it's not the way of God. We give up being part of the church. We lose accountability. We lose the heart to serve. We lose our missional focus to reach the lost. And listen to this, the amazing opportunities to become more like Jesus. You're rubbing shoulders with somebody that ain't fully sanctified yet. Go ahead and look on your right and your left and don't say anything. Just do it. Because I don't know exactly what phrase I'm going to give you to say, but you might want to say it more than you ought to. Sometimes we have this, like, this deception in our minds. We come to a church building, the church is the people, and we think so-and-so wasn't this way, and so-and-so said this, and it wasn't that. They disappointed me. Uh, they discouraged me. Uh, they offended me. Amen. That's going to happen because you're sitting next to people that aren't fully like Jesus yet. So, you know, you can go to Walmart today and the same thing's going to happen inside five minutes. It might take five months for it to happen here. And I think that's a pretty good ratio difference there, you know, if you ask me. You can go to Winco right now and you're going to get offended by the time you get to aisle 11. Something is going to happen. You understand? It's like, well, I went to church and I just got offended. It's like, that happens happens to me at Starbucks. I walk into the one down the street and there's a skeleton right there and I'm pretty sure he doesn't like me. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Right as you walk in, there's a skeleton sitting right there. He's a leftover from Halloween. <laughs> what God is doing in your life and in mine is found in Genesis 126. Let's make man in our image according to our likeness. 
Let's make man in our... And now sin distorts the way of God in our, in our life. Jesus comes to restore that. When we give our life to Jesus, Romans 8, 28 and 29 now becomes our, our life verse for all of us. It says, and all things work together for good. For those that love God and are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. What kind of good? What kind of purpose? He says it in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Everything in our life facilitates you and I becoming more like Jesus Christ. And that includes the church wounds that we get. Now, I am not advocating any abuse at all, period. If you have real abuse from church wounds, that needs to be forgiven, that needs to be cleansed. People, injustices need to be addressed. All of that needs to happen in families and in churches. But a lot of the times, there are a lot of very petty things that pass through that give us an excuse to no longer commit to what God's word says. Instead of practicing forgiveness, instead of practicing kindness and love, instead of saying, well, they didn't, but I will. That's the way of the Christian. That someone else's sin against me does not produce sin in me. That's the way of the Christian. That's, that's the responsibility of us knowing God's word. But if God's word isn't cutting our heart regularly, it's not going to come through our life consistently just won't happen. And so we know when Jesus says this to the church, you have endured patiently. We want this to be true of us and all that that means. He's not just saying you're holding on. He's saying that you have walked through all of these difficulties and trials and persecution and you've done all of that and you have stayed true to me. You've stayed true to my word. And so how we do that is what I've just shared with you today. Jesus calls us to a faithfulness which requires endurance and patience. And can I tell you that Jesus is pleased with you and with me every time that we endure patiently? He's pleased with us. He's pleased with us. We have his salvational approval in Christ, but a good father has a big smile on his face every time his son and daughter walks faithfully in obedience to him. Absolutely. It brings pleasure to God when we look like Jesus. Every time the father saw the son, every time he saw him, it was like, this is my son, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Can I tell you that every time God, the father sees Christ in you, this is my beloved son, daughter, in whom I'm well pleased. The father is, I don't know how else to say this, is obsessed with the son. He speaks about his pleasure in the son. When he sees Christ in us, it brings the pleasure of God. It increases the pleasure of God. Don't you want to bring pleasure to the Lord? I want to live in a way that is pleasing. Sometimes people challenge me and they're like, he's already pleased with all of my life. No, he's pleased with Christ and what Christ did on the cross for our salvation. But you and I can live in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Without faith, it is impossible to... Right, First Corinthians, or First Thessalonians chapter 4, he says this is pleasing to the Lord, that we would walk in such a way where we would steward our vessels. It's important for us to endure patiently. Now, what are the promises of Jesus? The promises of Jesus. Verse 10, he says, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews but are not but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that you will not, no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Just very quickly as we come down the hill here on this message, he says, first, I will vindicate you. Verse 10, we know that they're being persecuted by the Jews in that city. Obviously, Jesus is not anti-Semitic. He was a Jew, naturally speaking. He's saying that there are those that are persecuting his work in this city, and they happen to be Jewish. And he's saying, I will vindicate you. Even though you are being persecuted, I will vindicate you. The Bible says, vindication is mine, saith the Lord. Vindication is mine. If you get persecuted, if someone comes against you, if you experience opposition, know this, every person on the planet will give an account to a holy God. Every one of us will. And vindication is the Lord's. 
We can be sure of that for ourselves and also for those around us. He says, I will vindicate you. Number two, he says, I will keep you from the hour of testing. He will keep them from the testing that will come upon the whole world. I believe this is a reference that he will preserve them from the great tribulation. Now, I don't have the time to talk to you about when the great tribulation will occur or the debate over the rapture timing, but what we do know is that God's promise is sure that he will preserve. Some people believe he will remove them from. Others believe he will preserve them through. Either way, eternally speaking, God will preserve his people. That is the promise of the Lord, that no matter what happens on the earth, God will preserve his people. Number three, he says, I will make you a pillar in the temple of God. His promise that one, the one who overcomes will become a pillar is not literal, people. I want you to know that this is a figure of speech. He will not turn you into a pillar. Yes, I will be a pillar. That's all I ever wanted to be in my life. A caterpillar. I'm sorry. That was stupid. Just like, <laughs> oh, wow. Just stuff that goes through your head that you shouldn't say publicly with a microphone. And yet here you are. Forgive me, I have sinned. It has been many days since my last confession. <laughs> All right. It's a figure of speech. A pillar speaks of stability. It speaks of permanence. This would have been important for those in Philadelphia who had to be worried about the foundations of their homes being shaken by earthquakes. He's saying to them, I will make you a pillar, something that cannot be shaken. Pillars also represented honor. Because in pagan temples, which they lived in a very pagan world, he draws from their world. He's not endorsing it. He's just drawing from, metaphorically from their world. On the pillars of these pagan temples, there would be carvings with names on these pillars, names of these gods and goddesses, which leads us to our next thing because he's pulling from their world and their society, and he's saying, I will mark you. I will write the name of God, the name of the city of God, and my new name on you. To those who overcome, I will mark you. This is, happens throughout the book of Revelation. He's talking about his bondservants. I will write, write my name on you. God will mark us. This promise depicts ownership. It means that as a Christian, we belong to the Lord. His name identifies us with him. We are identified with Christ. We are in Christ. He marks us. But listen, he marks us eternally. Jesus marks us eternally. He's saying, I will mark you, and my relationship with you will stand forever. As I was thinking about uh, this message, I was, uh, I was drawn to a story in my life that was just kind of interesting. A couple nights ago, we had this windstorm, and uh, I was up late at night. It was 1230 or so, and I was writing an email to you. See, you need to read those emails I send out every week, okay? I was... This shame, shameless plug. All right, so I was up late at night, and I was writing an email on Tuesday night, and, uh, and there was a little bit of wind, no, no problem, and there's a window right behind me. My backyard is right behind me. I'm sitting on a couch, and, uh, and I'm praying. I'm praying in the Spirit. I'm praying in tongues, and as I'm praying, I just uh, I had this vision, and this vision was I, I saw a tree literally just fall right behind me, just huge tree fall right behind me. And as I'm continuing to pray, I thought, well, that's weird because I'm not thinking about trees or anything like that. And the wind wasn't that strong yet, but you know what happened over the next 90 seconds? The wind just picked up like whoosh. Everybody was there. You all live in 2021 in Federal Way area. The, remember the wind? It was nuts. The wind picks up just going crazy. And within 90 seconds, I heard this crack. And I thought, that can't be good. And before you know it, it's like the entire house shook. The whole ground shook, my, my house shook, everything shook. And I just thought to myself, like, I didn't even want to look back. I was like, I don't want to look back because there's about four trees that are facing this window like this. And I hadn't even, when I had a vision of a tree, I hadn't even thought that a tree was going to fall. Like I wasn't even like, yes, a tree's going to fall in our backyard, right? Because I'm thinking these are big trees. The roots go down deep. There's no way that a tree's going to fall in our backyard. And yes, a tree fell so hard in our backyard that it popped old roots from other trees out of our lawn. I mean, it's just, it's just like across our lawn, it's just laid out. But what was crazy was the tree would have fallen like this and it would have just smashed over our master bedroom window and right where I'm sitting. 
eight feet in easily to our house, and somehow it laid sideways. It hit our hot tub and it laid sideways, you know. And, uh, and I didn't really want to go outside and look, but I turned on the light and I, and I looked and I was like, oh my gosh, massive 70-foot tree laid out in our backyard. Crazy story. My wife, of course, woke up. Uh, my kids, have, for some reason, didn't wake up. I just, I wish I had that gift, you know. I don't. I have the hard time getting to sleep. Some people have the hard time getting up from their sleep. <laughs> I'm on one side of the spectrum. I wish I had your gift, though. So anyways, the next day, I went out, and I did take pictures. I didn't bring them to show you, but um, I'm sharing this for a reason. I took pictures because I was kind of fascinated by the fact that the roots of this massive tree did not go down very deep, and it was scary. And so we have this rock wall, and then our, our neighbors, uh, it's, it, there's this little bit of, of land, and then there's a fence, and then on the other side are these trees. Well, it knocked out the panels of the fence like it was a gate, and, and it's laid out there. But the roots that were sticking out of the ground, it's unreal. If I showed you the picture, it's, un, it's scary. And there's all these other trees now, and we're talking about how they might need to come down because the water has saturated and, and stopped the roots from going down deep. So there's a, there's a hindrance to the tree being able to grow down deep so that it's, that it's rooted well and it's strong. It looks strong, though. You know what's interesting? The trees look very strong, but it took one storm. It took one good storm to bring that big tree down. And I was thinking about that, about our lives, and we're reading the church in the city of Philadelphia. I was thinking, you know, it doesn't matter what your life looks like seemingly on the outside. Maybe even your past, you've been a Christian a long time. What matters is, are your roots down deep? Are your roots down deep enough to endure patiently the storms that are upon us? Because if they're not, friend, every good pastor, every good friend, every good Christian should say to their neighbor, their spouse, their kids, and everyone else, it is time to get our roots down as deep as possible. If we're going to be fruitful and faithful in the na- to, the, to Jesus Christ, For his glory, if that's really going to happen, it's going to require us to have our roots down deeper than they are right now. And that is not a guilty plea. That is a plea for us to go farther than we've gone before, for us to reach higher than we've been reaching before, for us to stand taller and stronger than we've ever been before. But let me tell you, it's not human striving that will get us there. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. It is his power in our weaknesses. We don't want to be a tree that looks all big and all it takes is one good storm and our whole life comes crashing down. It happens and it happens to many. But may it never happen to you and may it never happen to me. Amen? And so what I want to do today is I want to pray for a strengthening work of God through the Holy Spirit for you and for me and for us as a church. God has so much for us to do. This church had to go through so many things. For years, you and I are going to go through a lot. We're going to go through a lot. The question is, are we going to do it together? Are we going to do it in the strength that God provides? And are we going to endure patiently as we bring the most and the greatest amount of glory to our God? That's the question. Well, let's solidify that by prayer today. Amen? Will you stand with me and pray? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can go ahead and join your voice in prayer at any time. I will pray on our behalf. Father, we thank you today in Jesus' name that, Lord, you are our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Ephesians 6.10 tells us that we are to be strong in you and in your mighty power. Lord, it's not self-strength or self-sufficiency or the striving of men and women that will do it. It is the strength that you provide. And so as we look at this church as an example to us today, we do pray as Northwest Church, we ask, Lord, for your strength in our lives. We pray for that, that patient endurance in our lives, that we wouldn't just hold on, but we would advance. And you say to us, I have placed an open door in front of you, that whatever our weakness might be, You tell us that you will give us access to all that you call us to lay hold of for your glory. And so we believe that you are the one that opens doors. You are the one that shuts doors. We ask you that you would open a door wide to us, that we could bring glory to you, that we would share the gospel, that we would make disciples, that we would not just hold on, but we would move forward. And we believe by faith that is exactly what is happening today. 
that is happening for us, that is happening for our families, that is happening in our church. But we lay hold of it in prayer and we ask you, mighty God, give us strength to endure. Give us strength to endure in Jesus' name. We're so glad you were able to join us today. We would like you to find out more about Northwest Church by going to our website, nwcfoursquare.org, or downloading our app in any of the app stores by searching Northwest Foursquare Church.